Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Punch, Kick, Choke Chat. Um, if you are a longtime fan, if you've been watching, do not adjust your set. We're trying a little something different tonight, and we're going to jump right into things. We're here with Sifu Lauren Bernard, and we're just going to get going right now. So, uh, Sifu Bernard, I got a question for you out of the gate. Let's just jump into some meat. What does it mean to be an old school traditional teacher to you? What does that mean? Good question. Um, for me, traditional martial arts is about self-defense first and foremost. It's not a sport. So traditional martial arts is, is about killing people, unfortunately. <clears throat> so, or fortunately. Why is that unfortunate? Fortunately. I'm just saying, I, I don't want to sound like a bad guy, basically, you know? But uh, that's that's the main difference. Now, of course, there's all kinds of traditions, all kinds of cultures, but I, I believe that the traditional martial arts have been disappearing for at least 100 years. And, uh, and uh, you know, the percentage of schools that are still doing like old school traditional is going down, down, down. Sometimes you might have a school that's still doing traditional, like the art itself, but perhaps the training isn't quite as hardcore as it used to be just because society really doesn't want that anymore. So, um, so that's, that's what I think is traditional for myself. I pretty much dedicated my life to saving this style because I could see it was on the verge of disappearing and uh, so it kind of gave me a mission in life to learn this art and uh, to teach it. But notice I said, learn it before teach it. Cause sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes people mm -hmm. are teaching it before they learn it, you know? So I was like, oh, I want to learn it properly. I, I can't stand teaching anything unless I'm quite good at it because I just think that's phony basically. That's not traditional basically. Well, I mean, out of the gate, you just got nothing but nods and, and, and we're chipping in. And I mean, this is going to get cracked open. So, <laughs> so let's get right into it. So you, you say the last hundred years, you see this as being something that's starting to fade. So what are you perceiving like prior to that, that is now fading and what do you consider the cause to be? Well, I, I'm going to speak about China because I know more about China, but I think it's honestly, it's the same thing with the Meiji era in Japan, et cetera. It's basically guns. So, so uh, uh, when, when martial artists in 1870, they were still fighting with spears and halberds and this and that, that might've been an occasional gun, but it wasn't, but then by, you know, 1905, 1920, there's, there's Gatling guns and cannons. So the guys are like, why are you doing Kung Fu? A waste of time, you know? So that's, that's the number one reason. Uh, and what happened to Kung Fu is uh, because of that is they, a lot of them just became like instant beggars, basically. So you'll see these guys like begging for money on the street, doing shows. And this is the beginning of where it changes is where they said, uh, I got to make something that looks good because i'm begging for money so he'll add a cartwheel here and a turn there and land in the splits whereas originally there was none of that stuff the reason he's doing it is because the crowd doesn't know real kung fu from bullshit basically so they just they just they're gonna clap it's like you, you go to a tournament and the guy lands in the splits now doing the splits is not easy but we can agree it's not it's not that relevant to self-defense right <laughs> so the people are clapping bravo bravo and i'm looking <laughs> shit and the sifus are clapping about guys doing the splits it's it's nothing to do with kung fu you know so so these these unfortunately these these kung fu masters begging in the street for money was kind of like a really low low time in chinese martial arts and then later of course the communists took over and they, they didn't like the idea of uh socialist brothers fighting each other so they basically banned combat in china uh till like 1982 so what survived in, in the traditional Kung Fu world was all the guys who ran away from China, who went to Taiwan, Indonesia, Malaysia, Hong Kong, the US, Canada, uh, et cetera. And, and bits and pieces of it got saved. So, uh, so of course, you know, like my, like my grandmaster uh, was famous for his staff. Like he was fierce with his staff. He could write his name like with a seven foot stick like this. Like, oh my God. But who would practice staff like that anymore? For what reason? You're not... You know, if, if you were in trouble, you'd get a gun or whatever, you know, but in those days it was get a staff, you know, mm -hmm. I think that's the big difference really. Well, that's such a simple perspective that I love on it. Like guns showed up, martial arts fell by the wayside, communism showed up. Why would you be fighting each other? That's um, so when, when people talk about, you know, the Shaolin monks and, you know, they see them um, kicking each other in the groin and, and doing the backflips in public are, that's not as fundamental to what, what it came from is as or or is half of it fundamental like where do you go well, with that okay this is my take i'm not you know I, I it's my opinion okay so in my opinion the shaolin temple was a, like a university i studied at mcgill i didn't study mcgill i studied at mcgill so people came into shaolin temple often running away from the government and they would teach the monks their art like 
thanks for saving me. And so, so it's not like there's a Shao, I don't believe the Shaolin style thing. I think there's just many different people coming in and sharing their art with the monks. And of course, mm. now if they're monks, they don't have sex and they eat vegetables all day long and they train all day, of course they're gonna be highly skilled. Doesn't take a genius to figure it out. Uh, but the Shaolin temple was that were destroyed on several occasions. The last time was I think 1923. So between 1923 and 1980, there was absolutely nothing there. Okay, so of course the, the, the government of China is not gonna advertise this fact because it's all about the money, right? It's, it's, this is business. So they're not gonna talk about that now. So then the movie uh, called The Shaolin Temple with Jet Li came out. It was a huge success all over the world. There was riots, people were going crazy. They were showing really skilled uh, wushu athletes. And uh, so then they rebuilt the Shaolin Temple, got people from the local villages and maybe one old monk who was still alive to come and teach. But in my opinion, it's not, so it's not like the Shaolin Temple we're imagining in the movies kind of thing, let's put it right. that way. Right. And today you can see they're training like professional athletes, little kids are putting their feet here and this and that. And that training is wow, superb, but it doesn't make it, does that mean the knowledge of the, the techniques of combat are still there. I, I, my opinion, I don't think so. I don't think you can have one teacher not practice fighting for 40 years and then pass it down to the guy. Pass what down? You never did it. So there yeah. might be exceptions, but you know, this is my opinion. So I'll probably get a lot of hate mail because I just opened my mouth now. But. <laughs> You're not going to get it from, from, from us. Let, let's throw it around the horn a little okay. bit. And I, I think there's a lot to unpack here. So let's, let's just start. Hanchi Legacy, you know, uh, old school self-defense, we're, we're, do you agree with that? What do you call old school teaching? I love this guy. Already, <laughs> we don't have to go any further. That's what I've all, I call our thing karate jitsu, trying to bring it back to the old days. Like this martial arts is a street level martial art. It's meant to kill the other person. You and I have the same problem. We're afraid to scare people away from it. Yep. because we're telling the truth about it. And I'm a bit choked up. <laughs> Somebody <Thank> else. <laughs> Sensei Suino, thanks, Hanchi. Let me hear what other people have to say on that. Sensei Dauphin? Since we're talking about history, we need to talk about the present and you need to keep historical context always in mind, right? So guns appeared. But also, let's not forget that when martial arts was developed, there wasn't a strong political system. Most, most governments had a dictatorship, a military dictatorship. Am I uh, breaking up here? I can tell. A little bit. Am I back? How's uh, that? Yes? Okay. Wait. Okay. So what I was saying, Sean, is uh, politically at the time when guns showed up, there wasn't strong political systems. Mostly it was dictatorships in China, Japan, these Asian countries had these military rule. Um, and, you know, if you found yourself on the sidewalk somewhere, you didn't have a cell phone. There wasn't as many people around you. You actually had to be able to defend. It was a requirement to be able to take care of yourself. Today, it's no longer a requirement. It's just not. That's right. But if you come in a dojo, I think it still needs to be like it was when there was no political system because you need to train yourself for no police, nobody taking care of you, you standing on the sidewalk by yourself and taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. That's why you come to a dojo or uh, uh, a Chinese training hall. You go to the park to, to work this stuff out. That's my opinion on it. And I think technique is technique. We talked about this on our former episode mindset is really where the difference is now right mindset it's not that the techniques it's not like the punches are any worse today than they were back then but the mindset is different now right and and i think if you come to a good classical dojo the mindset is not different the mindset is the same the sense they start training i tell the little kids in here like you know tonight i said to them they asked me about the weapons on the wall they said do those have another purpose? I said, everything has the purpose that your mind makes it have, right? I said, what's the purpose of a chair? You sit in it. Somebody breaks in your house tonight. Can you use it for something different? Read the little kid, six years old. He's like, oh yeah, you can use it for something <laughs> Right? So like, 
you know, that's, that's my take on it. Right and on. if I feel passionate about it, it's because I think you'd be, you need to be able to stand on the sidewalk and take care of your shit. Like you got to be able to stand there and take care of your shit or you're living in a fantasy world. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I just want to add in, and Sensei Sweden, this is my take on it a bit too, is just like, I was talking to my students about it the other night where, you know, we've been doing so much sparring and I've been bringing it back to Kata. And I just said, you know, without Kata, we might as well just be kickboxing in our shorts and our t-shirts, which is fine. But the Kata gives us the route to the past and the route to the past. And, you know, my teachers are on the call is when you had no police, you had no street lights, you couldn't dial 911. And so getting back to that, and I love the word you use, Sensei, mindset is why it's different. Um, we're not poking each other's eyes out, but you know, when they're like, should I be hitting the bag like this? I'm like, you can, but you might not be doing that as much as that, but we can't do that in sparring, but you do do that in kata. And therefore with my initial question, what makes it old school is the mindset. Cause I, I really love what you said, Sensei Dofa, the punch is effectively the same, but the mindset around, am I trying to get a point? Am I trying to wait for the third man to end it? Or is there no third man? Cause there's no cops. And some of also for self-defense skill, it's a life experience. In other words, if you've never got beaten up a little bit, you know, you probably don't really understand what it's like. So I remember I would tell students, you're in a, you're in a bar and some guy's looking at you funny and uh, you go to the washroom, turn around, the guy's behind you and you have a problem. I'm like, but how stupid can you be? He has no, he has no, uh, in French, we say it's a VQ. He has no life experience. You know, if the guy is looking at me funny, I should probably be really careful going alone mm. in a washroom, right? So there's a bit of common sense kind of that uh, uh, is, is involved in the self-defense too. Yeah. Um, and then Sensei, what, Suna, you want to add, oh, sorry, sorry, Sensei, but are you seafood? I just, I was just going to say when, when I, when I trained in Malaysia, so I, I was there in 88, it's changed a bit, but it's still, but in Malaysia, like, once a month, you'll see some guy running for his life with two guys with samurai swords, throwing them in the back of the pickup going, oh, we missed them. You know, this shit happens all the time in Malaysia, you know? So it's, it's rock and roll. You, you, the cops, you just give them a few hundred bucks, sorry. You know, like, uh, that's pretty much what it's like. So that, oh. they, it keeps it pretty real. You know, it seemed like the Philippines, you know, you know, the Philippines is really dangerous, man. Be careful, you know, like, anyhow. Let's all move to the Philippines and Malaysia. You've talked yeah. me into it. <laughs> 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 anyway, Sensei Suda, you don't have to chip in on that, but if there's anything you want to add now that we got there. Well, I'll say this. The mangoes in the, the Philippines are ridiculous. Oh, so I moved yeah. there for the mangoes alone. Uh, <laughs> but to, to go full circle, um, you know, we've talked about this before on the show. Uh, my knowledge is mostly in the Japanese martial arts area. You know, that the study of the martial arts and the study of Zen came about because these guys had to, you know, contemplate the idea, hey, tomorrow... We're going to take a bunch of swords and stuff, and we're going to walk out into a field with other guys with swords, and we're going to start hacking at each other. So you not only have to have good technique, but you have to really have your mind together. And and uh, we don't live in most of us don't live in quite such a brutal time now. But the value, the martial arts origin came from that, and the value of the martial arts is proportional to the seriousness that you give it. Right. So the problem with dabbling in it or uh, uh, treating it frivolously is that you're not going to get 90% of the benefits that you get when you train really seriously, even if it's a little dangerous sometimes. I agree hundred percent. Yeah. Um, okay. Before we get to the, to, 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 to a bit of the intro, like we, we do in our old school format, let me, I, I want to pop that open for just a sec. Do you need Zen when you might possibly die or is Zen for people like us who probably won't die and therefore need to name a version of putting ourselves in that mind state? Let's start with you, Sensei Suino. Wait a minute. Ask that question again. Well, if I'm on my motorbike at 180K an hour and I'm about to go over the edge of a cliff because I misjudged, I don't actually need Zen. It's, it, I'm already in it. So if a warrior is going to possibly die tomorrow, <laughs> is Zen something they need to be at all conscious of or is it just inherent in it? And since we don't do that anymore, we've actually had to name and add Zen as a component of it. Well, you know, you're going off your uh, cliff analogy is happening right now. So yeah, you can right. you can you can die with Zen or not. It's up to you. But um, marching off to battle with swords happening is going to happen 12 hours from now. And you get right. 12 hours to sleep on it, you know, and wrestle with your demons. Right. And then um, get yourself in the right frame of mind to walk on that battlefield and prevail. 
or don't give a shit either way. So I think, yeah, I think Zen was important then. I think it needed a name. Um, uh, I could talk on this subject a lot. I think it needed a name and I think it was a very valuable skill then. It's a valuable skill now, only though in the context of great seriousness. And I'm it's really there glad I asked that. It. It's there whether you're aware of it or not. It's right. ever present all the time. Uh, you're either alive to it or you're not. <laughs> um, is, there, is there a Zen equivalent? For a sifu in in your Chinese arts, well, Zen is Chan Buddhism basically. Um, you know, my teacher was a. Uh, it's a family style. It's like father to son. You know, he'd have a few beers and he would tell me, "You think you're good?" And I was like, "Oh shit, here we go." And then I'd be like, <laughs> uh, "I'm not bad." And then like, this is like 30 years later, and he's like, "No, you're pretty good." And I was like, "Oh shit," he said, "I'm good," and that is like I'll charge into the battlefield now because like my teacher says I'm good you know what I mean? so he, he's old-fashioned just like shut up and nail the guy already stop fucking around already just go do it you know that that approach works but sometimes I need a little bit more personally and for me personally it's the waiting I don't like it's like a right. street fight a street fight is easy you just oh shit here we go boom, boom, boom. but if you say wait three months six days and 12 hours as a child mm -hmm. oh my god so I could probably work on my zen a little bit more <laughs> 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 right on. Um, people, if you've been watching, uh, we started right out of the gate. I love this already. Mm -hmm. I mean, my God, um, what what a cool thing. Hanchi, sorry, did you want to chip in with something? No, no, you go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, just for everybody watching, um, I'm Sean Benson. I'm one of your hosts. And uh, I want to introduce the people on the call. And then Sensei Dolphin is going to introduce our guest who, you know, I've already mentioned his name, but my God, we're, we're into it. Um, so I'm on the call right now with Sensei Randy Dauphin, who's my direct instructor. He's a seventh in in Legacy Shorenru, and he's a fourth in in Muso Jigid and Ishid Ryu Sword, and um, a third Dan, if I'm not mistaken, in White Crane. Uh, our White Crane, Sensei Dauphin? I'm a seventh Dan in White Crane because Jesus. that's what I just me to that. I'm writing this down, so I stop <laughs> embarrassing myself. Um, sorry about that, Sensei. And uh, yep, <laughs> I know. The I don't care. It doesn't, it doesn't really... It matters only to me because Sensei gave it to me. Other it than matters uh, to me that I made that mistake. So thanks uh, for correcting. Um, and then we're here with Sensei Nicholas Suino, who's an eighth Dan in uh, Iaido, and he's a sixth Dan in Japanese Jiu Jitsu, a sixth Dan in Judo, and runs the Japanese Martial Arts Center, and Hanshi Legacy, who's all our teacher. Um, and there's there's so many layers of teacher here. Uh, and he's a tenth Dan and is the founder of Legacy Shoren Ru and is also the head of the Canadian White Crane Association and is also uh, ranked as a first in in the IDO. And that's, we're trying this new thing. I think that's it. I've probably screwed something up. Sensei Dauphin, <laughs> help me out here. <laughs> yeah, it's okay, man. I'll, I'll fix it, Sean. It's okay. We do this on the fly, so that's good. You know, where you're stumbling, Sean, if I can just save you, is that uh, Sensei Legacy's teacher, Sensei Anthony Sandoval, graded me to a third dam. Copy that. that. So that's probably where that's stuck in your mind. Yep. Um, he also said the legacy was nice enough to let him grade a number of his students. So there were a number of gradings when Sensei Sandoval was here in Canada. So that's probably where that's in your mind. Um, I just want to also mention about Sensei Legacy is that student of Harold Warden, student of Benny Allen, Richard Kim, these are very famous people, pioneers in martial arts. And, you know, we don't often say this, but I want to say that uh, Sensei Suino's instructor is Katsuo Yamaguchi, who is probably the most preeminent sword master in Japanese history after World War II. Like, I don't care if somebody wants to challenge me on that. That's my opinion. And that's what I'm going to say, is that Yamaguchi Sensei is the best swordsman after World War II um, in Iaido. But I want to introduce... Sifu Lauren Bernard, and I'm really excited to do that. I always like education. He has a master's degree in political science. Um, he's published art, several articles. He's produced a two DVD set on his style, and he's the author of three books on White Crane. Super cool. Uh, Sifu Bernard is internationally renowned traditional Kung Fu master Disciple of fourth generation grandmaster, and I'm sorry, Sifu Bernard, if I pronounce this wrong, I really want you to correct me right away. So fourth generation grandmaster, Li Zhu Xiang. Li Zhu Xiang. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And he is also the official heir of the Flying Crane Branch traditional of uh, Fukien Wei Crane Kung Fu. Uh, Sifu Bernard has been involved in traditional Chinese martial arts since 1983 and was president of the Eastern Canadian Chinese Martial Arts Federation between 1994 all the way to 2010. He's very versed in the use of more than 18 types of traditional weapons, uh, Chinese medicine and internal work. Sifu Bernard was inducted into the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame in 2019, as was Sensei Legacy, inducted into the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame. So they're, they're compatriots in that. Um, He's traveled to Malaysia uh, to train with Grandmaster. Again, I'm going to ask you to correct me, Sifu Bernard. Grandmaster Lee Kang Ki. Is that? Kang Ke, yeah. Lee Kang Ke. Lee Kang Ke. And the, the former person that I mentioned, Lee Ju Xiang, that was in 1988 through 89. Uh, and he's traveled numerous times since then and now promotes the flying crane system. and it's international headquarters where he lives in Laval, Quebec. Uh, I like to give personal things that I, I had dinner since legacy and I had dinner with Sifu Bernard just a few weeks ago in Ottawa. It was a great night. I'm not going to tell all the dirty stories of what happened there, but it sure was fun. Um, uh, one thing I can tell you, he's super passionate about is it art. If that hasn't come through already, super passionate about it. Um, another thing, if it hasn't come through that I learned right away, is that he really values not only what he's learned, but also who taught that to him. The whole night he talked about his instructor and he very, very passionate about that. Um, another thing I'm going to say is he's down to earth. He's really funny. At the end of the night when everybody was gone and Sensei Legacy and I and Sifu Bernard were helping to clear the tables for Hunchitarian, we started talking about different techniques and he said, oh yeah, yeah, you know, and, Chinese martial arts, there's 52 ways to rip somebody's nuts off. And we all kind of like, we all kind of burst out laughing. And, and I really, I really love that. And I'm kind of a final thing that's really personal for me. And I know uh, the rest of us will nod our heads. He's a big time biker, man. And that's <laughs> always fun, right? When you can be, only bikers know what it's like to be a biker. And I'm really happy that he is one. So super down to earth. And I'm super proud to have him on tonight. And I can't wait to see him again. Fast, fast friend, great martial artist. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, so everybody watching, one thing that has not changed is that the button on the bottom is for you to ask questions. You're here with us live and we want you to take part. So uh, Andre's running our show tonight. So you'll see in the bottom on the chat button, you fire a question to us and we'll fire it to Sifu Bernard. Um, Sifu Bernard, what brought you into your first dojo and what kept you there? Mm, I think as a child, I always had an interest in martial arts. My father had an amateur boxing career, so he taught me a little bit of boxing around 10 years old. But uh, of course, he was old school, so that turned into like blood on the floor. And my mother freaked out and stopped it. That's it, done, you know. But I always liked that stuff, you know. And um, I also raised, I'm, I'm from Shawmedy Laval, which is kind of a rough neighborhood of Laval. It's always been, and it's still rough. So I was kind of like, um, how can I say? A little bit on the rough side of uh, things, you know, like for us, uh, smoking pot or dealing pot was normal. Everybody did it. It was like, all, it's like if all your friends have guns, then you have a gun too. We didn't have guns, but I'm just saying like, it was, it was, I saw, I saw, you know, guys get beaten up like every Saturday, you know, it's like, uh, all, so I knew like, I don't want to get beaten up, you know? So anyhow, but I was, I was lucky because my parents sent me to private school so I could learn French. And, uh, and then I went to university basically just to make my parents happy uh, and meet girls. Smart idea, right? <laughs> and uh, so I, you could say I was, I won't say the smart one in the bunch, but I, I had a bit of brains, you know. And when I went to university, I, I saw a demo and then I joined with my friend and he lasted a month and I, and I loved it basically. But I think also uh, I'm a part French Canadian, part Scotch Irish. And basically the families were destroyed on both sides from alcoholism and this and that. So I don't really have much culture. So to find somebody else's culture that I could take, I was thrilled, you know? Love that. I, th I think we all found a bit of that in our own way. Yeah. Um, and, and all those cultures, some details are different, but respect your elders, uh, you know, get up when somebody comes in the house, put food for the elder person first. All these things strike a chord with anybody with class and manners. So I love that stuff. 
Uh, we do too. Um, so talk to us about, you know, the, the dojo and, or, or, or whatever you would call it, if you have a different word for it, and then sure. how that unfolded for you to become okay, something so, you were um, never going to leave. So basically, in, in Chinese, by the way, it's called wushu guan. Wushu means martial art and guan means like place. So awesome. wushu guan instead of dojo. But same, same idea, basically. Um, so yeah, so in 1983, I saw a demo and it was this gentleman, Augustine Wu. I was at Concordia University and I, I, I basically had no talent, but I loved it so much. I trained more than the average guy. So segue to five or seven years later, now I was a senior student, despite my lack of innate skill. You know, it's just, I just, I, I was training four or five days a week for sure, right away. And in those days, I'm sure you all done the same thing. Classes at seven, we got there at six and we left at 10. Today, who the hell does four hour classes anymore, you know? But that was like, what do you mean? You know, like, uh, of course, you know? So, so anyways, I, I studied with him and um, he wrote me a letter to go study with his teacher. He had he had studied in Malaysia as a teenager, but he, he only studied maybe three or four years. So at some point he's running out of material or, or knowledge. He sent me to Malaysia and uh, I, that's where I met my, my future teacher, Li Ju Chan and his father, Li Kang Kei, who was 83 or 84 at the time. And uh, without the letter, I couldn't have, have gone in there because they would just be polite and not really take care of you. But because of the letter, so I do owe him that debt of gratitude, uh, mm -hmm. I got in. What happened is Li Ju Chan was only six years older than I was. I'm not exaggerating, 36 hours a week. So from seven years old. So, and he didn't really love it. He was forced by his father. But uh, uh, anyhow, so me and him, he became, in, in Chinese we say, subo, uncle. But we also were, had a friendship because we're close to the same age. So sometimes he, he would even say to me, if you want to call me by my first name, I was, no, 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 no way. But uh, uh, so, so I, I started really training with him. Unfortunately, my first teacher, over time, the relation just went from bad to worse to unbelievably horrible. So I'm just going to leave it at that. But mm -hmm. uh, I was stuck in Chinese politics. In Chinese politics, you can't switch teachers. But for me, I was like, well, I can't learn uh, from a guy who studied three or four years for 40 years. It doesn't make sense, you know? And they knew it. So they just said, okay, we'll find a way. And then unfortunately, over time, it just went from bad to worse. And eventually, my Mr. Lee just said, okay, you're my student because uh, there's no fixing this. I told him, I'll close the school. I don't want to be that guy's student. Forget it. So it's done. So I, I don't, I'd rather I'll just get a job. You know what I mean? I have a master's degree. I can get a, a good paying job. You know what I mean? So, uh, and then with Master <laughs> Lee, uh, uh, yeah, not like martial arts. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but with Master Lee, uh, it was, uh, it's tough. I learned the old fashioned way and he was, he was forced to learn. So he, I'll give you an example. Uh, he watched TV and smoke cigarettes while I was training, you know? And he was like, if you don't like it, you can leave you know but i understand he was like you're not that good you need to shut up and train so fair enough you know sometimes his wife would scold him that kid trained three hours he didn't look at him you know but i did my my fair share and then over time normally you know i'm sure many of you had this experience is when your teacher had a few beers and then one day he's like you know what you're all right come here and then i, I learned more in 10 minutes than people learned in 10 years because all of a sudden you know let's say we chop and then he tells me, well, the chop is actually a finger strike. And I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, you should, you know. And so we, did, we just became close and developed the relationship. And uh, then I, I brought him to Canada many times. And when he came to Canada, I'm lucky my wife is very tolerant. So she would, like, I could have a guest for three or four months. And, uh, you know, not everybody's wife will accept that. Mm -hmm. And so he would come for three or four months for, you know, I don't know, five or six times. And I went for almost as long. So... And he was very proud because he would come to Canada and he would see that Canadians were big and strong and training hard. M meanwhile, in Malaysia, they're all playing with their cell phones. So the only guys who are good in Malaysia now are 90 years old or 80 or 75. There's nobody young anymore in Malaysia. You know, I'm teaching actually my teacher students online because there's nobody left, you know? So it's a shame. So he was very proud that in Canada. And he used to tell me one day the flying crane is going to be in Canada. And I was like, are you kidding? Get out of here, you know? But he was right. So you mentioned your training with him, but you said that he was trained in an old fashioned way. What is an old fashioned way for his, a, a Chinese martial art? So his father, again, it's a family system. Okay. So they take it very seriously. So his father had a stick in his hand and he'd walk around. If you didn't do it right, he'd hit it. You know what I mean? So, so my teacher, he was famous for running away from his father all the time, jumping over tables and stuff like that. Till the other guys talk to him and says, look, 
you have no choice, you have to do this. And then eventually he did. His father was very strict in class, but very friendly outside of class. Mm. I'll tell you a story. So it's 1988 or 89, and I'm learning how to drum and I'm a lousy drummer, okay? Still not so good. <laughs> and I'm drumming and all of, and those days there was a fair amount of students because they all did lion dance, which is closely related to Kung Fu. All of a sudden people are running out of the school like rats. Um, what the heck is going on? Um, like, if they could jump out of the window, they would have done it. It's just because it was too high. Uh, they're, they're hiding on the roof. They're running out the back door. They're like panicking. Grandmaster's coming. So that was their reaction when Grandmaster came because they knew he's going to look, what? You're an idiot. You're doing it wrong. Blah, 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 blah. It's called me. I got a pass for some reason. He liked me. So I, I just got lucky. He was like, nice boy. And I was like, thank you, sir. And he told me, don't train too hard. <laughs> White privilege, I guess. I don't know, <laughs> but I'll take it. <laughs> well, my teacher learned, yeah, he actually trained 4.30 in the morning before school. Then they finished school around two. He'd come back and train around, they say three or four, and then a night class, six days a week for 15 years, you know? Right on. Um, and con sorry, but contrary no, no. to popular belief, in traditional Chinese Kung Fu, most schools do a lot of sparring. I love it when people say, oh, you do traditional, you don't spar. I'm like, the fuck are you talking about? We don't even, uh, we don't even wear gloves, you know? What, so, so he would, they would do say, it's very hot in Malaysia, so they can't train that long. So maybe an hour and a half, but the last half an hour is sparring and they're sparring with no groin cup, no mouthpiece, no gloves, and they're slapping, but they're slapping like, they're pretty hard. Like most people be like, what the heck, you know? And then the grandmaster would say, if you get injured, don't worry. I know Chinese medicine, I can fix you. <laughs> <laughs> So, so that's, that's what it was like for him. Um, so let's crack that piece open a little bit and then we'll, we'll chat around the horn about what, what, what that can look like in the different arts. But you're talking about out of the gate, the self-defense, this is for killing. Um, how, do we, how, how do you train that in your style? How do you impart that? How do you make sure that people aren't just doing stuff that looks good, but doesn't have martial virtue? It's not an easy answer. I'm still learning. This is one of the reasons I watch your show is because I'm learning off other teachers how to teach. We're learning every day. I, I try to motivate. I think one of the best ways, and I, I know you, some of you gentlemen were talking about this in the past, is do it so that they see you doing it. So sometimes I come into school and they're all chatting. I'm like, what the heck? Then I'll just go and I'll practice. And then I look at them and give them a dirty look and they're, oh, maybe we should practice. Duh, maybe you should practice. You know. So I think leading by example, mm -hmm. telling stories, uh, creating a myth or a legend it's part of the business of you know if they're going to be like grandmaster i'll train really hard great do it you know but uh, i'm still learning too and it's not that easy I, to get people to train more than three days a week wow you know and i think the real solution is that whoever your best student is they need to become teachers because that's mm -hmm. the only reason you would train 18 weapons or sword all day long for what you're not going to use it so if he becomes a teacher then he has a valid reason Thanks for that. Let's, um, I see you really nodding since this, we know I want to go around the horn, but I'm just picking up on, you know, how do you make somebody a classical killer when we can't be doing that? That's a, yeah, that's a big question to unpack. I don't, uh, number one, yeah, role, role model. Um, martial arts has to be physical. You have to do it, right? One of our guests said, shut up and train. So that's part of it. Uh, part of it is what you talk about when you do talk, when you're sitting around having beers. Um, and then happily, I don't know what the percentage is, but, you know, 5% of the people that come in and stick in your dojo just have that attitude naturally. They're like, fuck yeah, this is the best thing that ever happened to me and I'm going to treat it with the importance, right? And so as, as Sifu said, right, you know, uh, uh, your best students need to become teachers. It's nice to have a few best students around right? So you're not the only role model. Uh, it helps set the culture. Yep. Hanshi Legacy, what do you think? How do you, how do you make uh, an art a killing art when you can't be killing people? Well, we, I, in my personal opinion, we already passed it. It's, it's in Zen. It's in being able to be in the moment and realizing it. If you have your mind full of ideas that you're going to be great or other things are wrong, Find that, that when you can come and just simply be yourself, not worry about stupid things from outside. That, that's the only way you can really see her from the inside. And being here, 
body, mind, and spirit, and training it as hard as you can and as best as you can. That's how you bridge that gap. Realization of what you're doing, when it can be used, and when you're not doing the real art. So that sort of keeps you on the road a little bit. And Zen or a clear mind is everything. Yes, it's there all the time, but if you got $500 in your pocket and you're starving, the money is no good. The art is no good to you unless you have a completely clear mind. Only then will the art disclose its secrets and give you that, that knowledge. That's my opinion. Thanks, Anchi. Sensi Dauphin? Man, so I'm gonna, I think mindset and consequence are the two things. And I think Zen comes from training. I think when you're training, that's where you find Zen. I don't think you find it outside of the training. When you're training, you find your Zen and then you can apply it in other places. But I think your mindset is super important. And are you, I'm gonna tell you two quick stories about the mindset in Legacy Schroeder. I'm driving in a car. Sensei Legacy is in a car in front of me. In my car, I have Sydney Dauphin, Jaden Legacy. And in Sensei Legacy's car, he has his partner at the time. And there's a little bit of a road rage situation where this guy starts like swerving at Sensei Legacy. Here's the mindset in Legacy Schroeder. That guy jumps out of his car at the red light. What do you think happens, Sean? Sensei Legacy jumps out of the car. I jump out of the car. Sydney Dauphin jumps out of the car. Jaden Legacy jumps out of the car. We all start walking towards that car. And that guy's like, holy fuck, I got to get the shit out of here. And jumps in his car <laughs> and like hits the gas and drives away. And Sensei Legacy looks at the rest of us and goes, you guys just wrecked all my fun. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, like, so, so that's kind of like the mindset that we developed from this teacher that we've been training with for all this time. Um, mindset, Sensei Suino, you will remember this. You're teaching a big seminar. You're talking about the joy of Yaido, like you're off on this, like, and you say to one of my students, do you have joy in training? And this person goes, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. And you go, well, what do you think about and this person says, I think about killing people. <laughs> you, know, you said, oh, right, one of Randy's students, right? Like, that's, that's what you said, right? So, again, so it's mindset, right? And then I think in the dojo, there has to be, or in uh, uh, Wushu Guan, there has to be consequence for mistakes. And that consequence helps you to build that mindset. So, you know, if everything's airy-fairy and fun and so you do a shitty block when somebody punches and there's no consequence for that. Mm. You never, those two things build on each other, mindset and consequence, mindset and consequence. So I'm sorry, Sean, I, I pontificated there for a while, but that's my nah, take. That's, please don't apologize. That's, that's, a, that's a great set of answers that I really appreciate. Um, let's bring it back to you, Steve Bernard. Um, help some of us understand these, like, you know, the deep roots of Kung Fu. I mean, we're going back arguably much further than most arts we know of, um, aside from, you know, Roman wrestling, et cetera. So if you can talk a little about that pathway, and if you want, talk about how much you think, let's say the 36 families or the back and forth would have influenced Okinawan karate. Um, so of course, China is, is kind of like the Roman Empire, except much bigger, basically. So martial arts have been practiced there forever. There's this saying, Al Kung Fu comes from Shaolin. That's, that's horse, you know, the soldiers were, had Kung Fu already and they were training, obviously. Um, one thing about Shaolin, but is the, um, because it was like a university setting, sometimes you go, oh, you guys do that too? That's odd. Oh, you guys do that too? Well, of course, because they all shared techniques at some point at that certain university. And that's one way you can recognize traditional. Oh, look at that. All seven of these styles who barely know each other are doing the same technique. Mm. Why? Because it's a good technique. So that's that's one thing. But you know, when we say, you know, Kung Fu is 2000 years old, I mean, really, what's the link? It's 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 hard to establish, honestly. You know, same when you see these 37th generation or 20. 37 generations is really far, you know, legitimately six, 10 generations, you might be able to find uh, a more established 
relationship. Uh, for my white crane, um, by the way, there's an interesting thing is uh, generations is in Chinese, you're born at one years old. You're not born at zero like us, okay? And same with generations. So let's say the founder is, um, I'll say Gichin Funakoshi. His students, he's second generation. Yeah, I would say his student is a first generation student. They'll say, no, he's second generation because Gichin was first. But I'm like, no, he's the founder then. So there's a little bit of confusion. Sometimes you guys say mm. he's fourth generation and you're like, no, he's fifth. Depends how you look at it kind of thing, you know? So just, right. just mentioning that. Um, for the white crane styles, I actually know nothing about the 36 families. I, but I can tell you that when I see Okinawan karate, it's obvious that there's a link that they, because Okinawa is across the ocean from Fujian. And, uh, and a lot of these Fujianese styles, there's many, and they, they all look quite similar or share some things in common. Uh, uh, so in my opinion, when I see the Okinawan karate, they, they learn at least a part of what they do from some of the Fujian styles. And it looks like they made it harder. Maybe that's a cultural thing. Now in Fujian, there are some very hard styles where they tense up their neck in that, but there's also rather soft styles. So, so if you, people ask me like, which white crane does the, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not really sure, but like Goju, I, I would venture to guess, and I'm guessing maybe comes from eating crane or maybe from five ancestor style, which is a, a combo system. Um, it doesn't come from mine, but I see there's some things that are in common, you know? So sometimes the movement is different, but the application is the same. So, so let me just ask real quick. You said, you know, sometimes you watch the Okinawan karate and it's really obvious what is obvious? Like, what are you seeing that makes you go, well, yeah, some, that. some of the, the small hand techniques like this and like that, and the striking like this, striking with Phoenix. I say like uh, the other day we, you had in, interviewed uh, Jim Maloney and he did the Wei Chi Ryu. I, 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 that, that's Chinese martial arts, basically. It's obvious, you know, the way he's he's got his body in a certain way, like uh, like not my style, but the other one, uh, Mingha, they have their body a bit bent. It's very, very similar. So, Yeah. Right on. And then um, do you, what, what um, I'll throw this to you, Hanchi Legacy. Like, do you want to talk at all about what you consider or don't consider the link to about white crane and karate to Kung Fu white crane? What that? You can't, you can't, you have to, you have to look at, Chinese have the greatest influence on martial arts. The crane that we do comes from the Chinese. Right. Matsumura went to Fukien and learn from Iwa and Asan. And he brought it back and fitted it to our style. Of course, Matayoshi Crane and those type came before us. Absolutely, unquestionably. That you will find all the moves that we do originally came from China. They don't, may not travel the same path, but they're the same original techniques. By path, I mean linear paths as opposed to centrifugal force application. Mm -hmm. um, so then if I may touch on something else, it's off the subject a little bit. My question is, if you ask me, had I ever killed anybody before? My answer to you is many times. In kata, you can kill your opponent. If you don't do that, if you don't bring yourself to that, then those who, who uh, shun kata, or is it completely wrong? It's, it's obvious that, that they're wrong. And that's where in your own mind, in a clear mind of Zen, you can kill the opponent, not physically, but your mind accepts that so that when you face someone with a knife or a gun, you have to do that. How many people do you think if somebody pulled a gun on them would try to kill the other person? That would be very hard. In martial arts, you train that. Like, don't misunderstand. Uh, Matsumura and uh, Sensei Lauren, or Sifu Lauren, sorry. We can also hold a butterfly on our fingers. So I, I find that kata and the Zen aspect and, and that is all interrelated. And it all came from the Chinese. Thanks, Sanchi. Sensei Dofan? Yeah, uh, I like all that. Um, I like what Sensei said about many times in your mind. <laughs> that goes back to what I said about the Iyada student of mine who said, I think about killing people, right? 
if I do 72 Yaito cuts in here, I've killed at least 72 people in my brain. But that's just me. I'm a little bit crazy when it comes to this <laughs> stuff. So um, there's, a, there's a question here in the chat uh, from Paul Dupree, who some of us know and some of us don't. Uh, and uh, Sensei Dupree says, please ask him about his, I'm going to really butcher this uh, Sifu Bernard. So please correct my pronunciation. I, I will not be offended. Um, please ask him about his Choi Lee feud experience and how he compares that to Crane. Okay. So I, um, it's Choi Lee Foot. Thank you. And the Choi Lee Foot is a, um, I met in 1994. I did, it's a funny story. I did a demo in Ottawa. It was uh, organized by Sonny Tang and the Canadian Chinese School Soup. And they asked me last minute, and I says, what do you need? Like, what weapon do you need? So I, I ended up doing double broadsword. My double broadsword was like, okay, you know? So I do the double broadsword. And then there's this little Chinese guy, really badly dressed with a pack of cigarettes in this thing. And he looks at me and he says, good Kung Fu. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. And then he goes on stage and he's the best goddamn double broadsword I ever saw in my life. It was like unbelievable, you know? So guess what? We became friends, you know? <laughs> and then... Uh, so he, he became my toilet footmaster. So when, when I was having problems with my first white crane teacher, I just said, that's it, I'm out of here. And, uh, and I just said, and all my Kung Fu brothers had actually left too. And we all went to learn off this master. His name is Chu Kwok Chong, he lives in Hong Kong now. So he did a type of toilet foot called boxing toilet foot. Boxing toilet foot is famous for having a lot of good fighters, basically. So uh, they, they, like, they like to drill a lot. They like to fight a lot. Toilet foot has all these wild swinging punches, which I like because... You know, I'm 200 pounds, but in North America, that's not that big. You go to Texas, you're just a little guy. You know what I mean? So I want one thing I know I'm going to knock him to kingdom come. Like if I connect one time, you're done, you know? So aside from a finger's throat. So, so anyways, I studied with Master Chu and I loved it. Uh, but my expertise is still white crane. I practice trolley foot once a week just to keep it up. Uh, or maybe a few moves here and there. And I do my white crane six days a week. Uh, Interestingly, the trolley foot has a, a movement called chop, like a leopard fist, which actually means to stab. And my white crane punch is similar. So it wasn't so hard for me. People go, how could you mix the two? Oddly enough, I was able to do it, you know? So I, I'm basically, when I'm in trouble, I use my white crane for all the close quarter stuff. And if you see an opportunity to create the, the, the hole I'm looking for, it's all, a, it's all about the setup. I'm just looking for that setup. Then I see the setup, knockout. And then that might be trolley foot, you know? So I made it work somehow, but it's, again, thanks to a great teacher. This guy is a master Chu, maybe he's five foot four. He's a small man and he hits like unbelievably hard. So he had to like learn how to fight and make, and he, and he, I, I skipped the part. He used to fight a lot in Hong Kong. He was like an orphan basically and fought for money and all this stuff for real, you know? So, uh. He always will make sure he comes from the outside. He'll never come on the inside because he's small. And when he comes from the outside, it's game over. He's just creating, he's making like a trap. So you make a mistake and then he's going to go for your temple. It's a knockout, you know? So he was kind enough to teach me all these tricks, which I'm sharing now. And, uh, and uh, so that's, I love that stuff. But it's uh, actually, I used to smoke because hanging on Chinese guys, everybody smokes and like a real man smoke, right? You know? And when I did show the photos, I can't smoke anymore. It's too hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd love to ask you about that. Um, you know, uh, as Styles got into more sport and you, you know, you had kickboxing getting developed and you watch, let's say, different practitioners come up and then once they compete in something like kickboxing or MMA, there tends to be a homogenization of how they look. You know, they tend to get a similar look, even if they came through a style that doesn't look the same. I agree. I agree. But Kung Fu does seem to be something that's maintained its look over time. Um, you, and also you know, has... A, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead sorry. Go no, ahead. I, I want to hear your thoughts. Okay. You know, it's, it's, it's tough because we're going to be influenced by our surroundings. For instance, in White Crane, there's rolling on the ground and defenses against kicks at the very high levels. And in Montreal, we have some very strong Taekwondo, like Daryl Hannigan. And, and I used to ask my teacher, what about the kicks? And, and in those days, the Taekwondo guys were, they're, they're rocking it. So then he, so he kind of changed the curriculum, took the techniques that were advanced and brought them more intermediate. So we adjusted. So this is, we're going to adjust according to the circumstances. So of course, if the kids are seeing MMA and boxing, they're going to start copying it. And very often what I try to tell them, and they don't always listen, but what can I do? This is, is, if you fight the other guy's game, you have zero chance of winning. So if you're going to tie box a tie boxer, what are you doing? 
you, you can't win. You, you're not going to beat him at his own, unless you're Benita Jet or something like that. So I believe you have to trick the guy to play your game. And in Kung Fu, it's the downward punches, the grabbing. We love to punch, grab this, uh, 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 how do you say, unbalance and strike. And, you know, Anybody can punch and kick, but when it comes to grabbing, unbalancing, and striking, it's a little bit more skill. You, gotta be, you have to be brave enough to get in close. You have to be skillful enough to not get knocked out when you're close or whatever. So, so yeah, it's an issue. And uh, one thing, I, and I must say, I did learn, I have a student who's like in really good shape. He's an osteopath, and he's got some degrees, and he trained for full contact uh, Kung Fu. They call it Thai. Uh, his name is Etienne Metayi. And um, I never really considered... I was like, instead of doing bench press and curls, how about I just train my, my Kung Fu in my bag? And I'm like, I have nothing against bench press and curls, but I only have three hours to train. So I choose that. That was my opinion, okay? But when I saw him training for sports, I went, oh, it is true that being really strong doesn't hurt. Even my teacher <laughs> went, oh, interesting. Because my teacher, it's all about speed. He's just so effing fast. You, you, you bring up your hand and he hits you three or four times already. It's a forget it, you know? So you don't need to be strong to do that. You just need to be stupid, fast, stupid, good footwork. But when we saw the sport guy and I realized, well, you have to have the stamina. And so we're, we're, we're changing a bit too. But I still have a preference. Like if you give me, you only have half an hour to train, I'm going to train footwork and forms and a bit of bike. That's it. That's all I got. And then um, it's a similar question to what I asked, but... You know, the, the, the Kung Fu is really famous for its animal forms. Do, do those maintain their separateness over time or do they tend to homogenize over time as oh, well? Yeah. Actually, you know what happens is the public can't tell the difference. So I, so many times I have a student fight and the guy goes, it looks like kickboxing. And I'm like, uh, I'm not going to swear. Uh, 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 you're an idiot. So if I throw a punch and I have a Phoenix eye fist, watch, can you see it or not? So I have my Phoenix eye fist. I'm mm -hmm. punching with one knuckle, right? Now I put, and I go like that. Now I put a glove on. It looks like kickboxing. Well, no shit, Sherlock. You're right. stupid. You know what I mean? So this is an unfair critique. Now, sometimes there's Kung Fu guys who can't use their art and maybe they go to kickboxing. But, oh, you sidestep. That's kickboxing. No, everybody sidesteps. Right. What kind of an art wouldn't sidestep? So sometimes the critique is rather unfair, you know, generally from people who are expecting uh, like a movie. You know, and I'm like, that's not what happens. I've, I had guys tell me, oh, your student's not doing Kung Fu. I said to him, I can name every fucking move he just did. You don't even know what the, our art and you're telling me whether it's real or not. You know, so that's kind of uh, pisses me off, basically, you know. So we kick him in the shin and he goes, that's Thai boxing. No, it's called crane crosses the bridge. It's a basic move in white crane. You think only Thai boxers kick the shins? Come on, man. It's ridiculous, you know, like. Yeah, I really hear that. And then, um, Sensei Suino? Well, uh, just following up on that, so uh, I was going to ask, you know, you, you almost never hear about anybody with a Kung Fu background in, uh, in the UFC or in, in the major combat of sports. Uh, uh, is that because of what you just described? Is that maybe they have that background, you just don't see it? Or is there something in the Kung Fu culture that doesn't lend itself to that? I think, I think it's several factors. One, first of all, it's sad to say, but there aren't that many real Kung Fu schools out there. That's the truth, okay? So there's Kung Fu-ish, Kung Fu, you know, pajamas and splits. And some guys are doing real Kung Fu, but not too hard anymore. You know, so that's the first thing. And there never was that many Kung Fu schools. You know, and when Bruce Lee came out, everybody all of a sudden became a Kung Fu guy, but they weren't. You know what I mean? That's the truth, you know? Mm. So that's A. B, it might, it's just like some Tai Chi are real good fighters, but it doesn't attract fighters. No fighter goes, I want to learn Tai Chi. So therefore, it's a, a vicious circle. So for me, I've had some of my best students, the police officer, an engineer, a, an acupuncturist. The acupuncturist is making 200000 a year. Why would he go to UFC? You know what I mean? So, uh, so and also, he, when he came in, he wasn't looking for a sport anyways. That's why he joined here. Mm. So it's already, well, you've got the wrong crowd, you know? But mm. I would love to have some Kung Fu guys represent. Uh, and, and of course, you know, drives me crazy is when a UFC guy, and again, I respect these people, they're in fantastic shape, but a guy does a spinning back fist and they call it an MMA spinning back fist. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, I can't believe it. <laughs> it's a 300 year old technique, man. Come on, you know, or a Superman punch in choily foot. That's called Fei Chop Choi, flying Chop Choi. It's a Superman oh. punch. It's the same oh. move, you yeah. know? So it's just like, I'll say borrowing from everybody and renaming it, you know? But, the, but what we did learn from the MMA is of course, the ground game is something most of us have nothing, basically. Like myself, it's just, I, it's not what I covered. You know, in, in White Crane, you 
don't want to fall on the ground, you do everything not to fall on the ground. We have very low stances, so it's less likely, but it's not impossible. And if we fall on the ground, fuck, we want to get back up real fast, man. You know, that's typically come to a way of a... I think, so, that's every, I think that's everybody, isn't it, says Cicino? All the strikers, man. Uh, most strikers just not very good on the ground. Um, yeah, but I think they want to get on their feet. Like, I think yeah. people want to get on their feet. That's why we walk around on them. <laughs> well, there you go. Something to do that. Um, this is a, I don't know if this is a related question. This might be a little harder to ask. Um, so over my decades of martial arts, I've met a, a, a number of people that have studied Hungar, Xingyi, Bagua, um, uh, some of the other more obscure Chinese arts. And when they, by and large, when they study them in North America, they're, some of them are pretty good. Some of them are not good at all, as you, as you said. Um, but a few of them have gone over and spent time in China, uh, in Taiwan. And when they come back, they're at another level. Like, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, that you went over to, to Malaysia, et cetera. Um, why is it so dramatic why is the level of seriousness that, that is so exactly what happened with me every time i went to the orient i came back and my students were like oh my god what the hell so what happens is this is the history of martial arts in north america is many of the original and not all but many of the original instructors had only studied three or four or five years everybody wanted to learn so the only way to the guy can't make up what he doesn't know so the only way is to go back to the source or right so in my case when i went back to the source and then as i said our relationship was very close. Uh, of course, he's teaching me the tricks of the trade. I come back and it's the difference. So that's, I think, is the same case. As long as you find the right source, uh, same for yourself. If you went to study with your famous master, well, of course, it's a huge difference compared to me learning at the local uh, YMCA or something like that. You know, I think that's the reason, basically. And I think the history of most martial arts in North America, except a few exceptions, some guys got lucky and the teacher was great already. Many, many instructors went back to the Orient to to fix what they had learned or learn more or whatever it is, you know. So Hanshi, when he mentioned like Bruce Lee coming out and all of a sudden everyone knows Kung Fu, I, I really saw you like nodding and agreeing with that. And you were around for that time. Like, did you notice that all of a sudden there was just a Kung Fu school everywhere? And did you ever wonder how can so many people know this so quickly? Are you asking? Oh, Hanshi Legacy. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I thought you were talking to. Uh, uh, I'm ask me the question again. I was just. Oh yeah. Out. <laughs> really I was just saying that when he mentioned Bruce Lee and then everybody knew Kung Fu all of a sudden. You, you, I saw you really like smiling and laughing and nodding. And do you remember that time when all of a sudden, you did I you do. ever wonder like where did all these people learn this so fast or? I I do and uh, I did. And that's what it was. It was where, and pardon me for saying it this way, uh, Sifu, but where are those schools now? They just, they just never had any real makeup. Uh, I, it's exactly like Sifu says. That it's a very, very difficult art. It's like karate is, can be learned so much quicker just simply because of its a fairly basic way of, of defending. But uh, the Chinese art, just like most of Chinese things are very complicated. But once you get really good at it, it's, it's quite possibly unbeatable. Right on. Yeah. Thanks, Hachi. Uh, Sensei Dofan? So, uh... Sifu Bernard, I have a question, and I think it's a question for everybody. <clears throat> it's a question that Sensei Legacy made a statement to me once before, and I was like, that's actually kind of true. If we took geography out, because obviously if you're in, in Antarctica, it's going to be slightly different. So take geography out. If you took 10 people and spread them around the face of the earth, and they couldn't interact with each other, and told them, you have to go invent a martial art. And then you brought them all back together. Do you, the question I have is, do you think they would have similar techniques or do you think they would be vastly different? You know, of course, there's going to be many similarities, but you have to be careful because when you look at karate, and again, I'm, I may be wrong, but they, they, there's a lot in similar. 
But when you look at some of the Chinese Kung Fu, some of them are really different. Some styles are, everything is about setting up for the kick. He, every, all his hand techniques, he's just looking for that kick because he's a killer kicker. Some is centrifugal force and turning like, like a, uh, a top. Some is linear. So I, because of my Chinese martial arts background, I say, you might be surprised. Some guys might fight rather different. But of course, we're all going to punch and kick and, you know. Yeah, I, I appreciate that answer. I have a thought on it that I'd like to share. Said so, Sasuino, what do you think? I hear yours first. Yeah, my my thinking is that it's either it's either percussion or some type of grasping. Like there and there well, is that, nothing yes. else. It's either percussion or some type of grabbing. And if there's something else, I'd really like to know what it is, but I, I don't know what it is. So since it's, you know, do you <laughs> what do you think? I mean, is this is this a, a proposition uh, where they go out into the world and there's uh, other humans that they interact with, or are they? No, kind of I guess my there? my proposition, Sensei, is that we're all more similar than we are different, right? Yeah. We're all either striking or grabbing, um, and then other things influence that. Yeah, and even when you see something that's really cultural, like Kalari Payat or some of those other ones, right? Even if they're doing these extreme stances and it's real. Uh, we call it flowery, but maybe we just don't understand the, the efficiencies. Um, it's still the same shit, right? It's like it's still like the deep stances and the and the using the 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 the, the hips for power. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's only it, it's not it's it's complicated, but it's not infinite, right? There's only so many choices. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So it's legacy. Do you have any thoughts on that? Like, yeah, like if 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 you simplify it and just say. I want you all to come back with the best way to punch. Uh, you would get a lot of similarities. Probably all those people who are trying to save their lives would make that as direct and as hard as they could. So you only have so much body mechanics, right? And I, and I just feel that they would be similar. There would be some differences and there would be some similarities, but they would all likely punch it would probably all kick, you know, like that. Uh, just a humble opinion. Benz, what do you think? Well, you know, you talked about the percussion and, and the word that was in my head uh, or the words was striking surfaces. Like you're going to explore what can I hit with? And so that creates directionality. And, you know, something like Kung Fu would have a more, in my vision anyways, circular for some of the stuff, let's say, compared to how we're throwing punches necessarily, but it's still just a way to maximize, let's say that striking surface. Um, and then what you said about, you know, grasping or grappling, like it's really hard for me to do a wrist lock if I don't have that joint control, really hard for me to do an elbow if I don't have that one. So once that give or take, once that principle gets solved, then the way to it might have more of a dance like a capoeira or whatever, but it's gonna implement the same it's going to implement the same. So for me, it's a no brainer that it's all going to have some flower above striking surfaces and controlling one to get the downstream other. Awesome. So uh, see for Bernard, I'm going to provide a couple of thoughts and then you can have the final thought before we move on to some new thing is um, there's no new humans. We all have like two arms and two legs. And I think it's either culture that Right? It's not always efficiency that causes techniques to be a certain way. Sometimes it's actually like, I want it to be this way, right? Like I want it to be this way and that's why it's going to be that way. So as an example, I've often used this and I'm not trying to slang Taekwondo in any way, because if you look at where that is developed, it's in a hot region where, you know, it's basically flare level. But if you come to Canada and you're in Lavelle and you're on an icy sidewalk, um, multiple head kicks uh, to try and defend yourself is probably not the best way <laughs> to get through that. But where it's the same is percussion, right? Like they're, they're trying to hit you and hurt you at a target with something to knock you out and end it. So it's either for me percussion or grabbing. Um, and I see Sensei Copeland is chipping in here. He said, uh, Sifu is very funny. And he's super true to his art. And then Sensei Copeland goes on to say, biomechanics will be the similar ingredients in all styles, which I think is what I was just saying. Biomechanics, we all have two arms, two legs, a core, a way to 
to generate force with our body. And that's what we're going to do. So since Bernard, you can have the final say, and then we can move on to something else. I know Sean has things that he needs to move us on to. Okay. I'd like to talk. There's one thing I find sometimes is lacking in, in martial arts is theory. So each heart, sometimes they'll share similar theories. Sometimes the theories are quite different. And I find that the fighter who doesn't understand the theory and is able to apply it is not going to be skilled. And then, in other words, the real difference is, okay, what's your art and what's the theory and how do you do it? And many people they are like, oh, the theory is punch and kick. No, there's got to be more to it than that. So in, in Chinese Kung Fu from the South, we, we say uh, swallow, spit, float, and sink. The Goju guys all do it. I'm sure, do you guys do the same thing? Swallow. Anyhow, so we do Tun Tu, Fo Chen. This is the four basic ones. And then we have Pu Ti, Shuai Tang is pounce, lift, throw, and uh, uh, spring. So, so then when I'm practicing, this move is which one? Maybe it's two of them together. Maybe it's pounce and spring at the same time. So then people who don't know, but when you see the guy who's doing it properly using those theories, you're like, he moves different. Mm. And he moves different because he's doing it right. But most people are just in one ear and out the other. They don't get it. So same like, let's say you punch and I sink down to grab your groin. But my body sunk, but my hand floated. But because I think of it that way, it gives me a way to like to do it properly, basically, you know. So, so for me, the big difference was when I understood the theory on oh shit. So sometimes you, you block, and my, my teacher would go, "Is that springing? No, it's the long power." And he's, "No, it's springing. You're doing it wrong." And then I'm like, "Oh wow!" And it, it changes everything, basically. Yeah, I like that you said that because uh, actually, I think maybe an episode or two ago, since Suino talked about, uh, he said. You know, Randy, when you fight, you look like you're doing kata, right? Which is the theory, right? Of what we're, and that's, I think, that's what I'm hearing you say, right? Is that the kata is the, the theory and then you but, need but, to apply that. But what I'm saying is to do the kata properly, you have to apply the theories. Right. So that, that this is the big thing, you know? So if you're beating up a guy and it looks like you're doing kata, man, your karate is really good. <laughs> <laughs> um. So Sensei is alluding to my 10 questions, but I got a quick one before that I don't think is going to take you forever to answer. Um, I've noticed personally a resurgence in Kung Fu lately. I attribute it actually a bit to John Wick because the way he's moving uh, and then the Matrix type of way of moving, keanu has got the resurgence. Also, there's a great show called Warrior. I don't know if yes, you've seen that one. Show, yeah. I love that show. Um, so what do you attribute that to? And, and have you noticed that uh, recently? Have you been like, yeah, we have seen more people coming back around. We have not. The COVID really hurt us. Mm. Some of my, uh, some of my, my, uh, some of my instructors, they kind of teach rather hardcore. So uh, if the student's lazy, tells him to leave. I'm not, I'm not saying it's the correct thing to do, but that's what he does. So he doesn't have a lot of students. And uh, I'm doing well at the the headquarters, but um, I think I was always kind of doing well. So I, I'm not seeing that. Uh, Again, I find what really hurts Kung Fu is all the so-called Kung Fu guys claiming to be Kung Fu. And then they kill us. And then, they get, then the people justify, but wow, none of you can fight because they saw <laughs> something else, basically. And, and I get associated with that, you know, like, oh, great. You know, like, what can you do, you know? But what, what we try to do is have class and, uh, and show our art. And then people go, oh, these guys look pretty good. And then that's it. But uh, yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> yeah. Those are stupid people. You heard it said stupid. Yeah. <laughs> them, you know what I mean? Just, those are just stupid people. <laughs> like, how many times you see the the school that's not so serious with many more students than the school that's serious? You know why he's good in business. He's good in marketing, and and most, you know, most uh, especially us older guys, we're not good in business. I, I mean, just for me to go on go on a Zoom thing was like an, an effort. You know what I mean? <laughs> um. Really appreciate that. Thanks for that. Um, so it's time for our 10 questions, which is what we ask all of our guests. And I know you've seen some of the episodes. So we ask that you answer as impulsively as you can. But then if you want, expand on your own answer. Okay. Um, so question one, what is the most effective move in your martial arts arsenal? Strike the throat. Just chop the throat. Who is the most influential martial artist in your life? My grandmaster, Lee Kian Kei. The reason is uh, he was an elderly man, but I saw him one time I'm sitting at a table with some pretty nasty dudes in Malaysia and he's telling us a story and he punched 
He was sitting down. He was 84. He punched and my jaw dropped. He was 10 times faster than me. And he was an older man. And I was like, what the heck? And all the gangsters looked at me and smiled. Now you know. And I'm, Holy shit. So that just blew me away. You know, I, I couldn't believe it. So, And everybody asked, when he fights, what does he do? We don't know. What do you mean? He's so fast. He just hits the guy. What did he do? I don't know. It's too fast. I couldn't see anything. So, so that's, 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 that just blew me away. You know? That's awesome. Um, who is the most influential martial artist of all time and why? I guess Bruce Lee because of the, the fame in the movies. Uh, um, personally, I, I respect Bruce Lee, but I, I, I don't like it because people make him like the god of martial arts when they couldn't name five other famous Chinese martial artists. So it's, it's an unfair comparison, basically, you know, but because of his, uh, his fame, and he did do a lot for making Chinese martial arts popular, I'll, I'll give it to him. Uh, what excites you most about the next five years of your training? For me, I'm at the stage where I'm just trying to remember and do well everything, and I'm recording it uh, 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 so that so when I'm gone, there'll be a because some of these advanced things nobody knows basically, you know. And I, and I'm trying to get students to become instructors, but it's difficult because when the student gets about 30, 35, he has a good job, he, he's got better things to do. So I, you know, so I just hope to spread my art, make some instructors, and most importantly, and I've always been like that. If I wanted to, I could have 40 schools, but I didn't because I wanted the instructors to be the caliber of the old days. The caliber of the old days means he knows to use the halberd, broadsword, double broadsword. He can fight. If not, I don't want to have like the McDonald's version of, of our art. So I'll just be happy if I can preserve the art, share it, and uh, and sometimes yesterday, and I, I never teach kids, but I went yesterday for, for whatever reason, and the little nine-year-old kid gave me a big hug, and that felt so great. That, that that's, that's enough for me. You know? uh, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you get there? <laughs> I guess welcome took you too long, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite film and television martial artist of your own? I respect Donnie Yen because it's clear he really trains hard. Mm. Uh, 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 so Donnie Yen is, you know, he's my age, man. The guy's in shape, you know, and, and he's so I, I'm quite impressed with him. And uh, the show you mentioned, The Warriors, especially the season two was uh, some very good martial artists. I don't know who they were, but there were some excellent martial artists in there. And yeah. also like, uh, actually another man I, I respect a lot is Mr. Maloney from Halifax. So just like Hanchi Gary, I, I, I want to get to know you. So, you know, you meet people then you're like, wow, like say what, what Hanchi Gary is talking about Zen and this, now I'm listening here. I'm, I'm learning too, you know, so. I love that. I love learn that. Learn from our elders and uh, we, we can learn a lot. Sometimes just shut up and listen is a great concept. You know? um, <laughs> um, who living or dead in all of recorded history, if you got the chance, would you like to train with the most? Uh, maybe the founder of White Crane, Fang Xin Yang. Mm. Um, if everyone in the world could have the greatest benefit you've gotten from martial arts, whether they train or not, what gift would they be getting? Happiness. I'm a, I'm a nervous guy, uh, had a rough childhood. So when I train, it's like, it's like drugs. I, I do. I train and I feel so good. Oh, I was having a bad day. Now I'm, I'm it's like riding your motorcycle with your best friend in the wind. It's just, ah, you can't beat that man. You know what I mean? So happiness. Um, and then the last two questions come as a pair. What is your greatest achievement and what is your greatest regret? I guess my greatest achievement kind of occurred by accident was becoming the heir of the system. I never dreamed of it, you know, I, it just happened. Uh, so my teacher, I knew like at some point I became his best student, but I just never occurred to me that he would say, Lauren, you're the guy. And I was like, what, Ria, are you kidding? You know, and by the way, being number one sucks. All it is is trouble, <laughs> trouble, trouble, trouble. Idiots, <laughs> egos, fuck, all kinds of morons. All I want to do is train and be happy. And all I get is problems from this shit. You know what I mean? But uh, uh, so that that's my greatest achievement. And it just happened. Again, I had no talent. I just liked, I just was enjoying myself training. I just wanted to learn Kung Fu and have fun. My greatest regret, I don't really have too many regrets. I guess not training hard enough. So Sensei Suino, I heard you talking about the value of training. And as I said, I come from a different perspective, but later in life, I'm like, yeah, maybe I should have done a bit more of this and a bit more. Like, I'll give you an example. I never stretched my shoulders. Ha, huh. 40 years of punching, 
now my shoulders like, oh my God, now, now I'm stretching my shoulders. So I wish I had done it earlier, but you know, and, and I regret smoking and taking drugs back in the day because I was wasting my time. I should have been uh, training, but I, you know, but that, but it's not the end of the world. I still have fun. <laughs> Um, thanks for that. Um, I love those 10 questions. Hanchi Legacy, I really saw you, you know, light up and relate to the idea of being number one can suck. Um, anything you want to chip in there for people who are aspiring to run their own clubs and be their own number ones? There are things when you're running a dojo, you enjoy it because you're still doing it. But there are a lot of downsides to it. Uh, um, that's that's all I can say for now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sensei Suino? What? Yeah, uh, it, it's a related a related complaint I have. If we're gonna if we're gonna roll them out onto the table, is um, you know associations are uh, martial arts associations have this unique way of taking all the joy out of training when people <laughs> start vying for position. It becomes more important, right, to have oh, yeah. that title or that belt or. I say, you know, I learned this the way and that way, and it just kind of sucks the joy out of it. You know, we all go back to that core. Why do we start doing this and why do we keep doing it? Because we love it. It's this visceral activity, right? Where you get in the state of flow um, and, and, you know, being number one or being in the uh, leadership position is not always as joyful. <laughs> Sensei Dofa? You know, the reason why I love it and don't love it is because it's lonely there. And that, that's the joy of this show. Like every Thursday I get to come together with a bunch of people mm. where I, do, I don't feel lonely, right? Like, cause sometimes you talk to people and they look at you like you're fucking crazy. Like, they're like, what are you talking about? Like what? And you're like, okay, like, let's just talk about that TV show or the new item on the menu in McDonald's or whatever it is, right? Like, let's just talk about that. That's what you wanna talk about, that's okay. But that's, sometimes I have all these crazy ideas floating around in my head and I'm training and doing this shit and other ideas are flooding in. And it's lonely up there because it's only this group of people that you can actually talk to about them where they're gonna nod their head and go, that's awesome, I agree with you, or consider this, or that is actually crazy. And you're like, oh, okay, thanks for telling me I'm crazy. I'll push that one away, right? Like, <laughs> Thanks, Sensei, I appreciate that. Um, so I wanna bring it back to you, Steve Bernard, before we go around the horn with the question that, you know, I, I, I'm really excited to ask you. Tell us a bit about Fang Chi Liang. And, and Fang Chi Liang. I mean, that's, a, that's a root as far as we understand it. Yeah, so Fang Chi Liang is acknowledged as the founder of White Crane. Um, we don't really know much about her and the different, because in, when we say white crane, but there's, there's many different stories of white crane. It's a like 400 year old system. There's, I think often is like your teacher gave you the part of the story he knew. He didn't know the other parts. So it doesn't mean the other guy's wrong. It's just, we're all sharing. It's like that looking at the elephant and uh, blindfolded. We're all seeing different things, you know, but uh, from what we know, Fang Qingyang lived in the 18th century. Yeah. 1750s or something like that uh, was probably petite. Interesting enough, my teacher said her feet were bound. So that's something people don't realize, but quite likely. And we have some rather odd, like we like to stay close to the guy moving in a kind of uh, like a seven star, like a, a zigzag. And then you're like, well, if her feet were bound with that, that would make perfect sense. You know, the, the technique makes perfect sense, but the fact that her feet were bound. Uh, but aside from that, in my family uh, lineage, Fang Qing Yang taught four students, four main students. And each one of those is one of the original lines. Uh, the Yongchong White Crane people have a different story. I don't know. Uh, they'll say that she got married. We're saying she never got married. So, so there's, there's rather different interpretations. But one thing is for sure, regardless of that, because that's details in the end. What really matters is what did she contribute? So she was a woman. She was small. She didn't want to start wrestling with a big, strong guy. She's going to get, she's going to lose. Okay. So she said, I'm going to use... Uh, guile, trickiness, you know, look up, down, whatever, that kind of thing. I'm going to only strike points and I'm not going to give him a chance. So that's White Crane. And then all the other people who learned, and then some, some guy learned a bit of White Crane, mixed it with this, all these different versions of White Crane generally will have that trickiness, almost dirty fighting, not giving him any chance. 
when you say, so my team, my teacher would like, we don't want to like, I'm not imagining I'm a crane, but we can borrow the spirit of the thing. If you ever see a crane, I fish all the time. I see them all the time. A crane is very cold. It's just tiring. And then boom, done. And they go, oh shit. He just ate. That's it. There's no talking. There's no blah, blah, blah. You know, it's just done, you know? So that's, so when the action, same, I had a friend who was a professional boxer and he always used to tell me a real fight. And this guy fought like a lot. Uh, it's a light switch. It's on, boom, done. And then back on. Three seconds later, what happened? Oh, shit happened, man. That's it, you know? So that's that's uh, uh, the white crane way. So Fang Qing Yang, she taught striking points. Also, the other thing, too, is people don't realize it's one thing to strike points, but you might want to protect your points. <laughs> so when you're putting your hands up, put them in such a way that's protecting your... When you're retracting your punch, make sure your punch is protecting the the the, the, the dangerous points. So I think that's what she she gave. And then, of course, everybody took it and expanded, expanded. You know, some people are stupid. They believe that Fang Qin Yang taught every kata that, and all the white crane systems. I mean, that's ridiculous. In my white crane, we have like 80 hand forms. You think Fang Qin Yang made 80 hand forms plus the 18 weapons? Of course not. These are men who learned the general ideas, the theories, and then they just made drills and over. And they had no TV, no internet. Sometimes they were poor, they were rich, they had nothing better to do. They just trained, 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 and they made drills. And then that becomes the system. I think that's the, the, the story on Fang Qingyang. So in our version of Fang Qingyang, she never got married and she settled down in a place called Bai He An, which is a white crane temple, which actually you can find evidence of this temple. There's another mm. master in Taiwan called uh, Dong, I can't remember his, real, his whole name, who also claimed to study there. And my grandmaster also studied there. So our version is she, she settled in a temple and lived off her life uh, like a nun, basically. Right on. Thanks for that. I, I'm excited about that. Anybody want to add or ask any questions about that? Or should we go around the horn? I think we need to go around the horn, but I fucking love that answer. Like that's, that's, mm. yeah, that's well, awesome. Because I, I yeah, like to learn and I just learned a lot yeah. of stuff. Like, so. Yeah. Uh, well, that is where we are with the show, my friends, is um, Sifu, if, if you, if you again know how we do this, we'll start with Hanchi Legacy and then Sensei Suino, Sensei Dolphin and myself. And the last word will then go to you before we do a little housekeeping about what's coming up, um, we just chat about our time with you and, and, and take it home. So Hanchi Legacy, do you want to chat about our time tonight? Enlightening. I, I loved it. Um, you're so sincere. You're probably that good at your art. I'd really like, I would really like to see your art now. And um, I knew about Fang Chi Liang or Niang. I, I believe it's said in a couple of different ways. But uh, you may have just started another influx on Kung Fu. Is anybody hears you, can't help but want to do it. So you're a good representative for your style. And you, you'll you have me picking at your brain as well. Vice versa, and vice versa. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, thank you Hanchi. Sensei Suino? And I've, I've never heard anybody unpack the Chinese martial arts the way you have tonight. Um, and I just want to, I want to go down some back alleys of, of martial arts discussion with you um, because I've always kind of seen it from the outside, you know, just dabbled a little bit of Chinese martial arts. I know some people have gotten more serious about it. And so I've had these hints and echoes um, and I want to pick your brain about the names of people. And uh, so that's something I think we do in person over a, uh, sure. uh you know uh and i guess it sounds like neither of us smoke anymore but you can just picture sitting in a smoky bar <laughs> with a beer talking about this for a few hours so that's going to happen and we'll ha make it happen as soon as we can i can't wait to to, mm -hmm. to talk to you more thank you thanks thank sensei you. sensei dofat so i i write down a lot of stuff uh see for bernard but before I do that stuff, I want to know about the picture that's over your right shoulder. Like, uh, I've been looking at it. Who is that? That's yeah. the, my father was involved in politics. Uh, uh, that's the Jean Lesage, the father of the uh, Quiet Revolution in Quebec. He was a premier of Quebec. He basically took us out of a semi-fascist age and brought, I won't say enlightenment, but a more modern society. My father helped him uh, in the po politics. And uh, so he gave him that picture signed. So it's kind of like, you know, if you have something signed by Bill Clinton or whatever, it's kind of cool. So, so I get yeah. that. Awesome. I'm glad, I'm glad I asked you that question. That's out there forever now. So it's good that you, 
you mentioned that because someday 200 years from now we're all gone some kid would have been looking at that picture going it's his teacher yeah who the hell is that over his shoulder and now they'll know um so we started off right away talking about traditional martial arts and you said it's about killing people i love that <laughs> right like the that's truth, you know yeah that's a similarity i really like that i that's the way i think about it too and i'm happy to hear somebody else say that um and i, I also like just when you said uh doing the splits that doesn't really have much to do with defending yourself in martial arts so i i like that too um you said you came up from a rough neighborhood in Laval, and I'm going to tell you, like most of the people that we talked about, too, all talk about that. That rough upbringings brought them into martial arts to help them, and that's probably what happened like two, three hundred years ago. And the thing I thought in my head was, Canada's a pretty fucking tough place, no matter how much people think we're friendly and polite. You yeah. know, if you ask people, do you want to get up at negative thirty-two or do you want to get up at plus fifteen? Most people aren't going to say, I want to wake up at negative 32. So, mm -hmm. you know, most of us come from a rough upbringing here yeah. uh, in Canada and in other Northern cultures as well. Uh, and that's what brought you into martial arts. That's what brought me into martial arts. I'm from Windsor. I know that's what brought Sense Legacy. I know Sense of Serena has talked about getting beat up a lot in the, and fighting a lot. And so, yeah. Um, Concordia, I had no talent when you went in. We just talked to Sensei Mike Wall, who I know that you know. Uh, and he said, I was terrible when I joined martial arts. And, <laughs> and every single person on this call has said this before. I joined, when I joined with Sensei Legacy, there's a person, his name is Kenny Ibu Suzaki. And when he joined, he was 62 and I was 18. And I said to him, after we got our yellow belts, I said, you were the oldest and I was the worst. Right? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I liked when you said people now, you know, martial arts is not about income. It shouldn't be about income. And that's why people don't come because our world is about income. I can get a better paying job somewhere else and that's where I'm going to go spend my time. But there's a lot more joy and pleasure in the life that we're all living of course. than just scraping along for more money, right? I just agree. scraping along for more money. Um, you were talking about getting hit with sticks and stuff like that. And it made me think about trauma changes your brain and that's actually not a bad thing, right? Like if the teacher who's doing it understands why they're hitting you and what they're doing, it's actually probably a pretty good thing for you and for them, right? Like contact, whether it's traumatic or not, actually bonds people together. And so I think that's a good thing, uh, Sifu Bernard, that you brought up tonight. Um, love that history about Fang Shi Liang. Uh, I like that comment, that last comment you made about the lightning switch. That's, and all the things you talked about with fast movement, because if it's not aware to you, Sense of Legacy is fucking lightning fast, right? And always was lightning fast. And our art is built on speed and being quick and decisive exactly. in your actions. So um, I loved all the stuff that you taught us about the uh, Shaolin Temple at being a university. Um, we had a thing with BSI Skip this morning and you were talking about the bench press rather than train, you'd rather train. And, you know, I just want to share that I think the bench press maybe lets you train a little longer. And that's the way I like to think about it. I agree with you. If I could bench press or train for three hours, I'd rather train for three hours. But I like to think about the conditioning stuff allows me, I'm hoping when I'm like 70, that that conditioning is going to help me to train a little longer. Right. And, Sorry. I was going to say, I, and, and, and I don't disagree. As I says, I'm changing my opinion as I get older. Uh, 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 like now I want to do a chin up and I'm looking at my elbow and my elbow is going, don't even think about it. And my shoulder's <laughs> going, don't even think. And now, and now I'm, you know, I'm lucky I get acupuncture treatments from students and this, that, but yeah, had I been more careful in the past, I, 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 I wouldn't be suffering today. At the same time, there's only so many hours in a day. That was my argument. Well, how many hours, if, if you have unlimited time, by all means, do it all. But yeah. if you don't no, have don't. unlimited time, then you have to make choices. And that's yeah. I don't so for me, 
I had to do weapons because of like, we have a lot of weapons. If I don't train it, uh, you know, I'm never going to do it. So, yeah, I don't disagree with you, Sifu Bernard. And if you come in here and people see me lifting weights and stuff, but it's astronomically on the side of karate and Iaido. Like anybody here would tell you, like, if I only have two hours today, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do one of those two things. So I agree. I do the other stuff to supplement it. Um, I like when you said chop the throat. Made me think of Liam Neeson and Taken. That guy chopped so many throats in that movie. Right? Like, you know, it was just basically chop the throat, chop the throat again, chop the throat again. And I'm like, that's an awesome move. Um, uh, Bruce Lee, when you said Bruce Lee, uh, Sean and I just had a conversation a little while ago where we start, we've started to troll Bruce Lee fans where we like to put a little comment <laughs> on the, on the thing and then watch all the stuff. You couldn't beat Bruce Lee. Like Sean, I said to him, I don't care. I'm just going to say this. And I know we're going to get a lot of hate for it. I think in legacy share under there's probably 20 something people who might've been, might've been able to dominate Bruce Lee in a fight. I, I know a bunch of people are, all the religious Bruce Lee fans are going to hate that. <laughs> Um, but I'm just going to say it. I still think he's the most influential, but that's something different than actually being the most effective or the most. So it was nice to hear you talk about him. Um, I, I like that you think your next five years is about finding instructors. Sensei Suino and I have talked about that a lot. You got to be deliberate about that. And sounds like your thinking is about being deliberate and preserving the art. Uh, honestly, and then when you said being number one kind of sucks, like um it sucks and it doesn't i think we all enjoy it it's nice to be on a call with a bunch of number ones and uh man i just feel like we're kindred spirits uh, i know sense of legacy feels the way same way like and i know there's lots of fun in our future together and i'm I super agree. happy about that i know we're going to be riding twisty roads and fishing in different spots and doing martial arts together. A little bit of martial arts too yeah. at some point. <laughs> yeah, and it makes me super happy to think about that stuff. And thank you so much for coming on tonight. Thank you so much. It's yeah, my Sean. honor. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Sensei Dofa. Um, I just want to add two things. You know, the one for me is just your sheer passion at talking about how these techniques have existed for hundreds of years that people will, let's say, use in the UFC and think they invented. And I love that. I feel the same. I feel like, you know, there's those great videos like, Kung Fu or karate, the original MMA. And I don't think enough people are, are realizing that they are standing on shoulders. And uh, it's, I loved watching how passionate you get. And you're like, you don't even fucking know what you're watching. And it's like, yes, that's how I feel. And then the other thing is I really liked how you talked about Fang Chi Liang. She didn't invent everything that can be ascribed to her. And there's something really awesome about here's the kernel, here's the core. And then over time added, over time added. And even when you called it drills, you know, we talk about our first three crane katas, drills. And I love the way you, uh, or basic katas, um, kihon katas. I love the way you talked about that because I think sometimes, and it's funny since Dauphin just mentioned the Bruce Lee idea, people can lock on to this idea of like classical equals religious. And it's like, there's a big difference between roots, past, depth, and going, this was still just a bunch of people who added a little over time and we're part of that flow, whatever that will end up looking like. So really appreciate that reminder. So it's not just this frozen statue of a woman from ages past. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so over to you, How do, what, what do you want to go out on? Uh, I think for me, one of the other pleasures is just hanging around colleagues, respected colleagues. Uh, uh, it's so I, I like, World Kabuto a few years ago, I had no idea what it was. And then just hanging around and listening to people and no egos, no, you know, let's just be, we were all doing the same thing and just hanging around and talking. I really love that. And I learn a lot because as a teacher, we're always learning uh, that type of personality. You should handle this way, this, you know, or whatever. So I love doing that. And uh, for, the, for the people out there, I think, in my opinion, is the most important thing is that you're happy and you're kind to yourself and others. And in White Crane, my master always told me the highest level of White Crane was develop a good heart. Mm. So that's that. And I think that's true in every art, basically, you know. So I could kill you. You're a jerk. But you know what? I don't need to do this. Have a nice day. Good luck, man. Cool. <laughs> you know, like. A... Thank you for that. That's sort of a mic drop ending. I hate that I have to do some <laughs> housekeeping after. Uh, before I throw it to Sensei Dauphin, 
uh, to tell us about our next guests. And, and if you don't mind, since they say goodbye, I just want to say thanks to Robert Shlumsky, Mike Russell, Victoria Feth, Justin Shea, Alden Adair, Andre Sedeshev, who's running our show tonight. They are the, the, the backbone of this show and the technical aspects and making sure that you know the shows are on and the, the social media accounts. And if you're listening to this later on a podcast, they uploaded it. And uh, we're just so grateful for them. Sensei Dofan, what's coming up? Well, next, next Thursday is April 21st. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Anybody know what happens on April 21st? Everybody's hung over from April 20th? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we actually haven't had a host chat in like forever. So I'm like so excited to. And one thing I'll say is, since the legacy and I were talking on the phone the other day, and he laid out a bunch of heavy questions that he wants to get into with us. Um, but that's his birthday. So April 21st is Sense of Legacy's birthday. And we're going to do our host chat. So that's going to be super fun. Um, and then, I don't know, Sense Suino, do you want to talk about Professor Chet? I know uh, he's a Kent Nelson's, T. Kent Nelson's uh, BJJ instructor. I don't really know anything about him. So Yeah, but he's a legit uh, early days jujitsu, Brazilian jujitsu black belt from the Gracie tradition. He literally trained with you know, some of the early guys and, um, uh, I've trained with them. I've trained with them twice. I know my buddy Kent Nelson has trained, trains with them three, four times a year and has done so probably for a decade, just transformed their, their BJJ program. Um, and, and far more importantly, he's a, he's a quiet, but articulate man and, um, and, uh, very, uh, very thoughtful like a lot of the high level Gracie guys are. So I'm really looking forward to getting to know him. I only, you know, I've only, I've spent six hours with him ever. Uh, awesome. But yeah, he'll be on our show in two weeks. Yeah. So then Sean, the thing I want to go out on is uh, something that Sensei Bernard said, which was sometimes you just got to shut up and listen to your elders and just shut up and train. Right. And that's a good reminder of what the show is all about. Right. And this show is basically was, stimulated from what he's talking about it was sitting in the back seat of a car listening to sense of legacy talk to somebody else like you know john pearson or anthony sandoval or whoever that might be sitting in the front seat and you didn't have a place to talk you just had a place mm -hmm. to sit and listen and i just want to say thank you to sensei bernard and thank you to the people who sign in and just listen they just sit here and listen you're gaining so much by just sitting here and listening and if you look at it later, you're still going to gain. So that's what I want to go out on. Thanks, everybody. Super excited to see you next week. And uh, really happy you came here and joined us tonight. Thank you. Sifu, so great to meet you. Thanks, Sifu. Thank Thanks Thank so much. Thank you.